So our team, uh, Candace Brown and Platt and our research team, have moved their recession look out a little later in this year into early next year. That means that they actually have a positive number for GDP growth in the U.S. this year, slightly positive. And it'll be a mild recession, largely because the stimulus and other things, even though the Fed's raised rates, you see the, uh, the capacity of the American consumer to keep going. Um, and so they're basically mild recession early next year. But over the last year, that's been constantly pushed out, and so we'll see what happens. But mild recession, slightly down for a couple quarters and then back to uh, slightly up and then more normal in 24 and into 25. How much pressure is the U.S. consumer under right now? Well, it's it's an interesting thing because it's a sort of a tale of two cities. In the one hand, uh, our customers spend four trillion dollars a year. That spending dollar volume grew in the fourth quarter of 22 by about five percent. In the first quarter of 22, over 20, first quarter of 21, it grew 14 percent. So you can see the impact of them slowing down. Now it's up dramatically from 19, like 25, 30 percent in the aggregate, even more. So if you think about that, they're spending, they're spending well. The first part of this. Uh, January, the first 10 days or so, they're up about 6 or 7%. So a little bit fell over because of delays in travel. So they're spending nicely. The money in their accounts continues to be solid. It's coming down slightly. They're spending down some of the excess stimulus and excess savings. Uh, but they're all employed. I mean, the thing people forget is the United States employment picture is still pretty strong. And the Fed is, needs that to get a little worse to have that services side inflation come back in line. Within the context of this model recession call by your team, what happens to unemployment? Where do you see that unemployment rate go? So the, there are three or four core components. Unemployment gets to 5%, a little bit 5% plus as we move into the part, latter part of this year into next year um, and sort of stays there and comes down uh, you know, beginning the end of 24. Without unemployment, I, it, I always ask our economists, how can you have an unemployment-less recession? How can you actually have a two-thirds of the American economy driven by consumers if they're working and getting paid and wages continue to rise? How can we have a recession? And they can give me a lot of explanations, but the reality is, you know, the manufacturing side is slowing down. Some of the consumer activity is slowing down, but unless we see unemployment move up, I think it's hard to square that with the recession. And that's what's going on. So our unemployment is to move up to 5% or else they really wouldn't be able to predict the recession. Would this be a, a mild recession within lower income consumers? I look at a lot of things that consumers are feeling right now on the lower end, inflation. It's come down, it's slowed, but it's still very high. Average, those higher end consumers, it appear to still be out there spending aggressively. Look, the, the, the problem with inflation, why you got to cut it off, it hits the people who can least afford it because food prices mean the same, people don't eat a lot more. So what happens is think about the percentage spent on that gas prices, same thing. So that's the thing that people have to be careful about. And when people say, well, if they fight inflation, rates go up, you know, somebody can't buy a new car that's an affluent, that's, that's not really what they're after. They have to make sure the inflation comes down. So the core wage growth of the American median income household will exceed the expense growth and therefore they can cash flow positive. And if you look across multiple years, they're still okay, but in the more recent times, real wage growth has fallen back and that's caused some of that slowdown by the consumer. And speaking of slowdown, the Fed and their very, and their interest rate hikes have also really impacted the housing market uh, in this country, really slowed down that market. How long do you see this downturn playing out? Well, you know, and the reality is, you know, you're going along after the financial crisis at, in the recovery, a sort of a normal long-term growth rate. Then you spiked up in the pandemic because there was a demand created, uh, low interest rates plus people wanting to doing different kinds of housing thought processes, and that's coming down. And so. The Fed raises rates to get to the things that are rate sensitive, housing, cars, uh, uh, corporate debt borrowing. That's what they need to do to slow down the economy. That is their job, to get inflation under control. And so we'll see it tip down. But frankly, it's, it's, it's not the issue because it's not over lent and over borrowed as it was in the, before the financial crisis. Just the structure, our, our LTV and our mortgage portfolio, which is $200 billion, is in the mid 50s or something like that. So even refresh. So it's not, the banking system's in good shape. And so it's just different this time than that time. On the other hand, you know, they have to slow down the housing appreciation because that wealth effect lends people to start borrowing that money and doing things, and they've done that. I, I will, I'll call you this. You're the, I would say, the wartime CEO of 2010 at Bank of America. Those times were, I mean, they were absolutely terrifying. The home market slowed, stock market slowed. Is what the Fed is now doing with rates, unwinding that liquidity, are they sowing the seeds for something like that again? You know, they, I don't think so because... Uh, 
the transparency of the Fed going back to Jackson Hole and, and, and Chairman Bernanke saying, we're going to tell you what we're going to do and adopt plots and all this stuff. Yeah, they're signaling the market. Sometimes the market takes them on saying, you know, you're not going to raise rates as much as we have rates going up, you know, five, five and a quarter. The market sort of say, maybe not, you know, yeah, those types of things. But I think the transparency, I think the care, I think the amount of data, honestly, people forget how much data is there. I, you know, and they're getting it real time and so they have a, a better sense. But it's tough to get the services side inflation down and that's what they're focused on. So if people are looking for indicators, they're looking for a new claims for unemployment, still very low, as low as they were in history almost now. And uh, uh, job creation is still slowing down, but still pretty strong. So I think those are the indicators we're looking at, but the real time nature of this, I think, allows them to see a little bit further uh, the impact of their activities. And then we're all feeding them data um, about the market's activity and stuff that wasn't transparent before, where the, you know, where the P's are under the mattress, so to speak, in terms of risk. You know, when something goes down instantaneously, we could all tell them what the exposure is to you know, one of these name things that has a problem. So I, I think it's just different. Now, is it perfect? We'll find out, but I think they do a pretty good job. We do a pretty good job managing these companies. My peers and colleagues around the world you know, take it very seriously to maintain the stability and the, and the capability of the bank institutions, and the regulators and central banks have taken the same approach. Equity markets have stabilized a bit uh, to kick off this year, and in large part because of this expectation, I think, of we get rate cuts at some point this year. Do you think that happens at some point? in the back half of the year? Our, our equity market uh, strategist, uh, Savita Sebramanium, has basically the equity market flat for the year. Now, within that, she's saying there's great opportunities in different sectors. But in, in, in part, you know, she said that last week, and then she sort of was confronted with the market actually moved up to match her year-end thing. So she sort of said, you have to think about this. And so that's not an exact 4,000 number, but it's a number that gives you an indication that the feeling is, as a recessionary environment's there, as corporate debt gets more expensive, as the labor market softens, you know, the idea of earnings growth in, in, for companies, you know, that's one of the challenges. And so I think that's all going to wash through the system. But it, does the Fed need to lower rates this year? We're still thinking, and I think people have to listen to them, they may leave this higher for longer just to make sure they squeeze out that services side inflation. And just as a slower burn on that. Uh, the theme here at the World Economic Forum is a, a, a frag cooperation in a fragmented world. Now, you <clears throat> met with uh, the administration, you were in that room with a lot of, the, of your fellow CEOs. Uh, how fragmented is the world from a business perspective? Well, I think there's the challenges in, with the administration yesterday, you know, bipartisan here to engage with the business community. By the way, leaders around the world here to engage with the business community. That's the unique thing what Davos has is, you know, you can walk down the street and, and see, you know, people from administrations around the world. You can see business people around the world. You can see uh, advocates of all different types around the world. So that's the value. And I, so I think the issue is you know, trade. And the issue is the free trade and, and the globalization, the supply chain globalization, things that provide a great benefit to the world's citizens, you, you know, called into question. But it's a little bit more about resiliency supply chain than, than people think. And so people have learned a lesson about s single source supply at the lowest possible cost. Maybe it needs to be multiple source. That's going on in the business community. But what they want to know is what are the set of rules that they can actually develop those multiple sets and, and drive it. And yet we've got to make this tr just transition for energy. We've got to do a lot of things in the world to solve a lot of problems. And the best way to do it is with the cooperative agencies. And so whether it's the WTO, whether it's the IMF, whether it's the World Bank, whether these multilateral and in governance themselves, G7, G20, the, the idea of coming together and saying, we've got to solve these problems. We can have differences. We can be strategic competitors, but we have to have things that we're trying to solve, and, and that's what you hope comes out of sessions like this.